Welcome again to the Lou Bar Center, Eckstein Hall at Marquette University Law School. I'm Mike Goucher, and this is a, a late afternoon version of On the Issues. This is our uh, continuing series of conversations with news and policymakers. People are doing interesting, important work in this region and beyond. Today, we are doing something a little bit different. We're doing a, an event in conjunction with Startup Milwaukee Week. So we're talking about startups. We're talking about venture capital. We're talking about how to create a healthy innovation economy in southeastern Wisconsin or Wisconsin or in the Great Lakes region for that matter. So uh, what I'd like to do is uh, take a moment or two to introduce our guests, our panel. I'm going to start at the far end. Ken Johnson is a partner in the Badger Fund of Funds, which was formed by the state of Wisconsin to invest in Wisconsin venture capital firms that will in turn invest in new Wisconsin-based companies. He is also the founder and managing director of Kaganza Capital Partners. Seated next to Ken is Aaron Gillum. Aaron is a senior vice president for 50 South Capital, which bills itself as an alternatives investment firm. It manages the Illinois and Indiana Fund of Fund programs. He is also president of the Venture Club of Indiana. <laughs> Kathleen Gallagher is the executive director of the Milwaukee Institute, a nonprofit that is dedicated to connecting a high technology entrepreneurial economy in the, and culture in the Great Lakes region. Uh, Kathleen is also a founder of Five Lakes, which among other things puts on a, a really good annual conference that uh, features technology and entrepreneurship uh, topics. Before that, she was a Pulitzer Prize winning reporter with the Milwaukee Journal Sentinel. And Matt Cordio is the co-founder and president of Skills Pipeline. That helps growth-focused companies in the Midwest uh, find top technical and creative talent. Uh, in 2011, Matt founded Startup Milwaukee, and he's become a leading voice in Wisconsin's technology and startup communities. He's also involved with the Five Lakes Initiative. Won't you please give our guests a warm welcome to Marquette Law School. So as I always say, I'd like to build a foundation for our conversation today, and, uh, and it will be a conversation, and then we will take some questions at the end from all of you. So uh, uh, we hope you'll listen closely and uh, have lots of great uh, questions at the end of this event. Uh, I wanted to begin with Matt, uh, since this is Startup uh, Milwaukee Week, and, and let's talk a little bit about how we're doing in terms of creating a successful, vibrant innovation economy. How would you say Southeast Wisconsin is doing? How is Wisconsin doing? How is the Great Lakes region doing? Yeah, so um, Startup Milwaukee, we've been at this kind of effort for eight years now, trying to um, establish a more entrepreneurial, vibrant startup ecosystem here in Southeast Wisconsin. Um, this is the kind of the third or actually fourth year of Startup Milwaukee Week. And, you know, we think that there's definitely a momentum building in the tech and startup ecosystem here uh, locally. A lot of excitement. We see that in the amount of engagement we, we get at our, our networking events. Um, we see that in interest um, from more uh, venture groups from around the Midwest coming to Milwaukee to meet with companies and, and actually invest in Milwaukee companies. Um, so there's definitely a significant momentum here. Uh, but we still have a lot of work to do to uh, lay the framework to uh, really grow our, our tech and startup ecosystem here. And, um, you know, we've seen larger companies get involved in the ecosystem, and, and that's uh, definitely a positive uh, thing. But ultimately, we have to remember that uh, tech company founders really have to drive a lot of the conversation about the resources they need, whether it's capital, connections to customers, mm -hmm. uh, service providers, uh, to build a strong, vibrant tech and startup ecosystem. How do we compare to, to competitors in, in this world in terms of startups, in terms of venture capital? How are we doing uh, compared to other parts of the country or other metropolitan areas, for instance? Yeah, so um, certainly, um, you know, the majority of venture capital uh, is flowing uh, to the coasts and uh, is, is concentrated on the coasts. Um, we see, uh, you know, continued efforts to uh, bring more capital here to the Midwest, and, and um, you know, entrepreneurs like Steve Case have, have really taken this on with their Revolution Growth Fund and and other efforts like these, uh, the state fund of funds, which we're going to talk about later today. Um, but, uh, you know, there's definitely a, a lot of catching up to do. Milwaukee, I think, even if you look at the state data, the number of deals happening in Madison versus Milwaukee, you see uh, more activity happening in, in Madison, which obviously is obviously a smaller city. 
uh, more activity, I think Milwaukee has a lot of opportunity to uh, improve our numbers in terms of the amount of starts, the number of deals occurring as well. What do we have, Kathleen, in terms of assets? If we're talking about the metro Milwaukee area, for example, what are the assets that this community possesses that, that you and others on this panel believe can lead to even better outcomes in terms of venture capital investment, in terms of startups? Before I answer that, can I just um, highlight Matt's shirt? <laughs> sure. It is um, fancy. Like well, it. he did get it for this week, and I want to make sure we give it a shout out. I mean, to, what do you guys think? Do you like the shirt? <laughs> you tell we're partners. <laughs> <laughs> um, in terms of the assets in Milwaukee, uh, you know, obviously Madison has the university and all of the technologies and research that come out of the university. Milwaukee has um, big corporations and a lot of technology being developed in those corporations that we think. Um, there are probably better ways to unlock than we've found so far. Mm -hmm. um, and the medical college has, the medical college. has, you know, it's the biggest research. Um, and UWM is now a, a research university too. Well, if you look at the numbers, the medical college dwarfs everybody else. I mean, UWM has, what's that designation? I think it's a tier one research yeah, institution. Yeah, I think a lot of people don't really know what that is. But I mean, in terms of their research spending, um, medical colleges, it has to be three, four times bigger and, 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 and much more concentrated research. So if you want to look at where is the academic um, institution with the most potential, it's clearly medical college. And, and we talk about the importance of a, an innovation economy. Uh, Kathleen, I know you, you covered this with, as a reporter. You work in this field today. So um, why is it so important that we have a healthy innovation economy? Um, because that's where companies come from. Uh, you know, most jobs created come, from, come out of startups, and, you know, that's um, where new disruptive technologies come. And, you know, the, the older companies, um, the legacy companies need to um, either develop new technologies, which they tend not to be great at, or buy it, and startups are where they find it. Mm -hmm. so. I want to ask both uh, Ken and Aaron the, the same question. So, so why is all the money going to four states, or why is it going to the coast? I mean, most of the money, not all the money, but a lot of it is going out there. Why is it? And what kind of potential is there in, for example, the Great Lakes region, whether it's Illinois and Indiana, which your firm uh, works in, or whether it's Wisconsin, Ken? Uh, give us a sense of, of why the current situation exists and what the potential is for changing that for a place like the Midwest? I mean, in terms of why the money is maybe flowing yeah. to the coast or why the money exists more in California, Massachusetts, New York, that's where 80% of all venture capital resides. I mean, you definitely have um, more research institutions in, the, in, those, in those areas, Cambridge, Boston area, and so forth. Uh, you also have just a lot of high net worth individuals, uh, large corporations, um, high GDP coming out of all those states. Um, but then there's also something that I think gets glossed over, and I think that's just a, a cultural, uh, cultural uh, uh, difference between uh, some of the coastal cities in the Midwest uh, when it comes to taking risks, starting new companies, taking chances on new innovations, uh, launching your own startup. Um, that kind of risk-reward culture is just now starting to occur in the Midwest but it's been going on for generations in places like California. And that's why you have you know, large tech companies there like Google, PayPal, uh, YouTube, uh, and so forth, Microsoft. All of them exist in that little Silicon Valley ecosystem because they were rewarded for, for taking a lot of risk early on in their, in their careers. Ken, give me your sense of, of why, why are we see so much of the money in these uh, same few states, but also how Wisconsin gets to get a little bit more of the action. It's like open season, right? Um, so, so I'm a little bit different. First, first. I was you know, going to sit next to you. I know you were supposed yeah, to tap me when I, I was but now I feel really him. safe out here. Uh, so, so first, um, in the crowd, just to get some some crowd interaction. How many people out here have um, invested at least twenty five thousand dollars in a startup company as an angel investor? Do we have a fair amount? Oh, we do, probably a dozen. How many here have? have uh, have quit all their jobs, threw everything on the floor, and, and, and went out and started their own brand new company as their only source of income? Do we have many entrepreneurs that uh, get about a dozen? Um, it's, it's always interesting because the audience uh, is different if those who have actually tried. Um, the things I always look, again, the reason I take data is uh, my background's an engineer, 
And so that um, rule number one is if you don't have good data, you're not going to have a good outcome. And rule number two is we have different data sources, we're going to have, we're going to have different outcomes. And so what I look at is, you know, Wisconsin has been uh, rated um, last two or three times by the Kauffman Institute as uh, the, the worst startup uh, state in the United States. At least, at least we're consistent. Um, and so, <laughs> And so that we, we were lucky a couple of years ago, we got Brown here, but the Wisconsin Tech Council was kind enough uh, to pay to have the Kauffman Institute send someone here to give a presentation of how they, what things they saw that correlated well with successful startup ecosystems and, and, and what they were. And so a few things, um, the, the, uh, having a tier one or a large research university, how important is that to having a successful startup ecosystem according to the Kauffman Institute? None. It, it's unimportant. Um, it's irrelevant. Uh, the, the second thing they looked at is we talk about a lot is cash, venture capital, how much money is available to invest in startups, what's the correlation between what would be available cash, venture capital, and all these things in, in a, 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 a successful startup ecosystem. Again, there's no correlation. In other words, neither of those things, whether you have a lot of money, short of money, tier one, has, has, does not, at least the statistics that they show, the data they have, doesn't show or support the fact of having a successful startup system. So then you look at the other things from the Kauffman Institution and say, hey, you know, what, what were the things that seemed to attract or, or were around or looked good in those systems that are successful that we've talked about? Um, and, and the first one always that turns out is, are people making money? In other words, investment capital is like bonds. I'm sure you guys all have your own IRAs. You have a pension fund at work. And, and, you're, and those things, what you look at, you don't ask them what type of companies they are. You don't ask them what type of products they are. All you ask is, you know, when I retire, am I going to have, am I going to have my cash? Am I making a nice return? And remember, that's venture capital is exactly the same. We're an investment segment that's high risk. And if you don't make high return for your high risk, we become what is called a flyover state. They fly by us because no one's making money here. So from the Kauffman Institute, the first and most important thing was, are the people in the ecosystem, that is both the entrepreneurs and the investors, are they making an, a, a return that is comparable to the risk they're taking in investing in something that 50% of the time you lose all your money? Uh, and the second thing that they looked at that was a very high correlation is the, is the talent skill, the human capital that's in the ecosystem. And human capital has really two components. A uh, one component is the people starting the companies, what we would call entrepreneurs. Um, and you know, like all things in life, uh, you're ten times better the second time around. And so that entrepreneurism is just the same as anything else we do. We all have careers. We know what we were doing at 25 and what we're doing at 45. We're better. And so that to have entrepreneurs coming back two, three, and four times it improves the probability, makes your ecosystem. Uh, it makes it, it makes it better. Um, the other part of the human capital equation is uh, the people that are investing. In other words, uh, we looked at angels. There, there's nothing wrong with angel investments. I, I, I invest myself and write $25,000 checks foolishly all the time. Um, but that's probably why we don't have a good ecosystem. In other words, if your investment capital is looking at friends and family, they're looking at to make Wisconsin better, they're looking at it to um, because they think it's a wing-dang doodle that's going to be disruptive or some crazy technology they know nothing about, um, that's probably not good for us because the return is not going to be very good. And so that the human capital portion is, are the people investing the capital into our ecosystem, are they trying to look at the goals and objectives that will bring in, so, yeah, I assume we all know Sequoia or Kleiner Perkins. So those type of big firms, they, the, the reason they would fly in here is because they're going to make a lot of money for their investors. And so if we, at the small level, aren't making a lot of money for our investors, there's no way other people are going to come in. So certainly from my point, uh, Mike, I'm, I don't think capital is an issue here. I think in some ways Wisconsin has more than we need. Um, if you look at a, at a deal flow side or the entrepreneurs, we have a lot of them. But as the plans I look over, um, most of them are not high return ones. They're kind of interesting or they're social or they're, they're good for the economy, they're good for the country, they're good for a lot of things, but they're not good for me writing my $25,000 check. Um, and I think those are the issues that really put us in the bottom five of the United States. So, so do the ideas have to be better? Is that what you're saying? Remember, I never said ideas. So that, um, <laughs> let, let, let's talk about one, let's talk about a killer deal. 
So are, are, are all of us no, no American girl here? We, we're all American girlfriends. You know, we know what they are. They're, it's the doll company. And I, I happen to know a little bit about it because uh, the founder is somewhat related to the family. I, I know her well. And so that, remember, she went out and started a company to take dolls that we normally buy for $50 and put a story around it. They're made in Czechoslovakia. Uh, they're selling for $1,000. And um, she couldn't get any investors. Nobody in Wisconsin wanted to invest in the doll company. And so, you know, like all of us, she went to the only one that would really do it. That was her husband. And so he put in a million dollars with the rule that you can't look for money anymore. You either lose it or win it on my million. Um, so, so seven years later, she sold her company for $750 million in the form of a check to Mattel. This is a great venture capital deal. And so, you know, the husband made 250 times his money. So that, um, I don't know if that was a great idea. I don't know if I would have invested in it. It really dolls it for $1,000. But from, from an investment viewpoint, that's what the things we've got to be looking for. So what made that work? Pleasant role in the start of the company was perceptive enough to see in the United States there was a new class of people starting. That would be mothers that made a lot of money and they wanted to have an attachment with their daughters. And so she did these thousand dollar dolls in which you would give it to your daughter in your 10, 11, 12, 13 as a memory. And this Ken, segment of society would be. They don't cost a thousand dollars. Oh, the ones I did. I must have, I must have been a loser. But the two I got were a thousand dollars. Then we crushed Ken, them. They you were jobbed. <laughs> but so, so when you talk about idea, I think the perception among the community is an idea has to be technologically an idea. No, no, it's a product. Mm -hmm. So if you have a great product that no one else has and you address a market that no one else is addressing and you price it really high so you make a lot of money, your investors will do well. So I think it's, I'm always worried with the idea of idea because it has that okay. perception versus a product which is a doll. I, I want to ask uh, the other panelists to weigh in on this, this notion of, of is there enough venture capital uh, um, money available in a place like Wisconsin or in a place like Indiana or Illinois. Give us a perspective of, of, of other states in the Midwest. Um, they've actually, I think, have a little bit more invested than, than Wisconsin. Tell us about, for example, Indiana. Yeah, so the, what, what Mike's referring to is the Indiana Next Level Fund, which is a $250 million fund of funds that was set up about just under two years ago. To, uh, to capitalize the VCs that were in the state of Indiana, as well as to attract fund managers from out of state that want to make investments in companies in the state. Um, we also manage the state of Illinois, Illinois Growth and Innovation Fund, which is on its third fund now, and the third one's about $700, $750 million. Um, and same premise, to you know, capitalize the funds that are based in the state, as well as to attract outside investment. Um, so when people ask the question, like, do we have enough capital in, in the states? I mean, it's always a tricky question. I, I, I like to think that, yes, we do have enough capital. Um, the, 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 the question that kind of goes a little bit um, maybe with um, Ken's point, but maybe a little bit against it, is, is that um, you know, when, I, when I talk to my VCs in, in Indiana about how many billion dollar companies have we exited in the last 10 years, um, the answer is one. And it's exact target, in case anyone wants to look it up. In uh, Indianapolis. In, in Indianapolis, yeah. And what that company did when it exited was all of the senior staff went out and became angel investors mm -hmm. the next day. Two of them went out and started separate venture funds. Everyone who worked there can now say they have worked for a billion dollar, scaled up, unicorn, whatever you want to call it, um, and have seen the recipe for how to replicate that. So there's probably at least two dozen companies around Indianapolis that have exact target DNA in them that have seen how to build a billion dollar company, work with coastal investors, um, you know, know what it takes to put together a, a genius staff, a genius team, uh, and then eventually exit. In Illinois, um, you know, you've got companies like, like Groupon. Um, there's, there's probably eight or 10 or so companies that have, that have done the, the billion dollar exit thing in the last, uh, five, six years, um, it's getting to the point where that, that's great. Um, I don't want us to be able to name all the, all the billion dollar exits um, because you need that kind of DNA in your entrepreneurs. You need that kind of DNA in your investor base to know what to look for in the entrepreneurs and how to push the founders so that they're not just thinking about building a $10 million company or $20 million company. They're constantly thinking about, hey, how do I make this bigger, get a larger return on our investment, um, you know, and make it better for everybody and to have 
multiple millionaires come out of the company and not just one or two. Give, give me a, a sense from, from each of you, Matt and, and Kathleen. What do you hear from the startup community here? Do they feel venture capital uh, is adequate? Do they feel they need more? What, what do you hear in this neck of the woods? So um, I think that a lot of the startups that complain about not enough uh, money in the ecosystem often um, have valuations that are higher than they should be because they valued the company high uh, early on um, with the early investors. Or, um, I, you know, it's always tricky to, but a lot of times they're also kind of wannabe companies where, um, you know, uh, Uber Eats came up with the idea that we should, um, that you could use your phone and um, get them to drive your food to you. And so they're a company that said, oh, I want to be like Uber Eats, instead of a company that came up with a new disruptive idea and um, tried, to, tried to do something that hadn't been done before. So a lot of times the question around here is, well, let's look around and see who did it, and then let's do it ourselves instead of, let's do something no one else did. I, my chairman, John Burns, who I like to embarrass, is over there in the crowd, and uh, he's the founder of Mason Wells, and he often says uh, it's easier to compete at high levels than low levels because there's less competition there, and I think we need more entrepreneurs who want to compete at high levels. Mm -hmm. I think at times entrepreneurs do have challenges accessing capital uh, here in the Milwaukee area, but what's great is we're starting to see um, you know, the Midwest really becoming a region versus being driven by Milwaukee. So a great example is, uh, you know, there's a product uh, company, uh, Xena Workwear, which just was able to raise capital, and, and that deal was led by a Chicago VC. Um, you know, Bright Sellers just raised a, a, a large uh, round last year, or oh, earlier this year, yeah. yes, mm -hmm. and, and that was led by Steve Case's Revolution Capital. So, you know, I, th I think that, um, the entrepreneurs who are doing novel things, building uh, you know novel products, uh, I think are are able to attract that capital. Do I think we would benefit by having more angel investors, more uh, you know professionally trained venture capitalists in the Milwaukee region? Certainly, I think so, and I think uh, the Badger Fund of Funds is working on that. Yeah, I, I want to talk to Ken about that. For for people in this room, explain where we are with the Badger Fund of Funds and uh, the number of other uh, managers out there of, yeah, give us a sense of where we are. Okay, uh, just, just one comment on, on, the, on the unicorn. So one, uh, you know, American Family, I just said it was 750, um, you know, uh, Champ, does anybody here know Champ? Champ's up in Eau Claire, just, just had a, a buyout of $900 million. So uh, the entrepreneur of that company was 39 years old. He was a piano major at Eau Claire, started his own company. He did very well, he owned about half of it when they bought him out. Um, in the last couple of years, we had New Wave, which was VI, which is about 350 million. Um, uh, Kiganza had um, NI, which was 165. So we, we have, in, in, so don't, don't, even at 50, we do, we do have some nice exits in return to our, our investors in, in the state. Um, in, in, as regard to, to the Badger Fund, um, you know, again, it's, it's some of the things that, um, that I think about on the human capital side. So as you can see from my first one, I'm, I believe that the issue is much more human capital than anything else. And so that um, the, the state of Wisconsin, we're all taxpayers here, um, in their infinite wisdom, because they're always very smart, uh, the legislator, uh, legislator in the hot air box very, very nicely decided they would put $25 million of your tax money, my tax money. So you know what tax money is? It's money that used to be mine. Um, and so they took the money that used to be mine and they decided to put $25 million into venture capital um, to start the Badger Fund. Um, myself and Sun Mountain Capital, my partner, uh, competed against three or four other firms in, in, a, in a process and we were selected to be the manager. Um, and as the manager, we, we really had three things that we wanted to do that the reason hopefully the state, the state chose us. Um, so one was we wanted to have uh, venture capital funds uh, scattered across the state what I call target geographies. In other words, I firmly believe that entrepreneurism is per capita. There's just as many entrepreneurs in northern Wisconsin on a, on a per capita basis as there is in Milwaukee and Madison. It's just in Madison, they have a lot more infrastructure. They know what to do. If people in Milwaukee knew what to do, we had three or four venture capital funds here, I would expect the same result as we're getting in other places. Um, and so that the Badger Fund 
um, has funds in, in uh, La Crosse. We have one in Nina. We have one in Port Washington, one in South Milwaukee. We have a larger uh, $25 million fund in Madison. And then we have one fund that is just focusing on entrepreneurial clubs and universities. And we have a second fund that's focusing on spinning out um, from manufacturing firms. So we, we have an array. Um, the, the second thing um, that the Badger Fund want to do, of course, as you've heard from my first uh, um, comments, we're very much return oriented. So the, the, we wanted to be pri private and public, so the state put in $25 million. Um, I raised another $10 million for the Badger Fund, so that's $35 million. And then all the fund managers, they had to raise $0.60 cents for every $0.40 cents we put in. So the Badger Fund right now has approximately between $125 and $150 million of capital to invest in Wisconsin, leveraging the $25 million we got from the state. And because it's, there's, your tax money's in there, we can only invest in state companies. Th those went over pretty well. Uh, the third component um, of the Badger Fund is that we wanted all our fund managers to be of an age that they could do five, five venture funds in, in their career. And for those that don't know venture capital very well, each fund is five to seven years. So if you do your math, that means all the fund managers had to be in their 30s. Because I saw as human capital, you know, I'm pretty old and some of us are younger in that we see a generation change. And so that maybe we could leap to the front by being, taking the new young ones and having them have us be on the forefront instead of kind of a, on the caboose. Um, so our seven fund managers um, are all between the ages of, of uh, 32 and 40. Uh, they're all from the state of Wisconsin. They all went to college here. They're all their families are here. Because the worst thing would be we go all this work and they take the money that used to be mine and they would start their venture funds and when they became successful, they'd book out to California. Uh, so I don't think that's going to happen. Um, we've got two of them here. David, you want to just raise? So David is... is Have does, him stand up. Yes, yeah, stand, stand up. up. Da yeah. David, good enough. Da David, David is running the, the, the fund in the Fox Valley. And, and Rochelle here, uh, two down. Uh, next to Brown there. Can she, she wave? Or, yeah, she can or wave. Uh, she's, yeah. she's doing the fund that's going to be focusing <laughs> on entrepreneurial clubs. So, you know, Brahm is from the Wisconsin Tech Council, if you want to know in between them. So we're trying to get some diversity in the state to have venture capital all around and certainly have a couple funds in Milwaukee County. So quick question, how do you find uh, these folks and, and how are they trained? It's not, it's not just, I mean, there is training that's involved here. Oh, that's can it. I answer that? One time sure. he called me up when I was a reporter and he said, I heard there's a bar on the south side of Milwaukee where a lot of financial people hang out. I'm going there tonight. <laughs> do not that's give training, my secrets huh? away. They'll all show up there the next time I'm looking. The, the secret will be out. Um, so, so there was a couple ways. Um, so, so the Badger Fund has, has uh, 20, so uh, Brian and I, we're the fund managers. We put in half a million dollars. And so that um, we, we have 25 investors, of which the most common investment, of course, is half a million dollars, because that's what we put in. Um, and so a couple, a couple of our, our investors uh, stood up, one being in, in, in uh, Fox Valley, so that Paul Schultz is an investor in the Badger Fund. Mm -hmm. He was a successful businessman. He has to be a chemical engineer like me, so I kind of knew him. And so he helped me recruit, he helped me recruit Dave because he was in his area. I don't know if anybody here knows Don Weber of Logistics Health, uh, a terrific guy, about my age, two tours of duty in Vietnam, uh, started his own company, sold it for 100 million plus, and he wants to, his legacy, he wants to be the biggest person in, uh, in La Crosse, and so he brought in a person he would like to do and was an investor in La Crosse Fund. Actually, I met Rochelle. Um, I, I, I do volunteer work, because as Rochelle, I happen to be a, a big volunteer at the Jazz at Five in Madison, and Rochelle is another volunteer. We met at the beer tent serving uh, volunteer beer to the uh, patrons. So I guess you, you find them she in- She did have a job as a lawyer, right? She had, yeah, she did. Uh, <laughs> yeah. We never got down to the job, so I, I think you, know, you, find them, you find them in all, 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 walks, of, all walks of life, right? Um, you, you know, for those who want to be a venture fund manager, the thing I gotta tell you right away is, you know, it takes about 12 to 18 months to raise your money. And uh, while you're raising money, you don't get paid. So the person like both David and, and Rochelle had jobs that were obviously very successful before. They had to quit their jobs, pound payment for 12 to 18 months without pay to raise their capital. So, I mean, you really, you really gotta want it. And they have to get through your training, right? They, yes, we, we, we do, um, um, Brian and I, uh, so Brian runs a fund of funds, uh, uh, a firm that does only fund of funds down in Santa Fe, but he went to Carleton in Minneapolis and was at GE for seven years, so he's kind of Midwest background, and I liked him. We, we, we put together a course 
Um, and so all the fund managers had to, had to take a course for 10 weeks from uh, me. Um, it was like an MBA course, they took it at night. Uh, then they had to go down to Santa Fe for three days of back office um, training. Uh, if they passed, if you want to call that, um, I, I can only say the 13 started, nine actually finished, two of them never raised money, I don't know what happened there, and seven, you know, and we're not raised money. Once, once they got done with their course, the Badger Fund would make a commitment of 40% uh, of, uh, of their fund. So for, for, for David and, and Rochelle, it was both $4 million that we would invest of money that used to be yours. And as soon as we made their investment, they had to quit their job and start fundraising. So all of them, all of them did the same, all seven. Aaron, uh, real quickly, does this sound similar to what you folks do in Indiana, for example? the way you identify people, the way you train people? The short answer is no. Uh, <laughs> so both funds in Indiana and Illinois are, are set up for performance first. Um, the Illinois one also has two other objectives, uh, diversity as well as economic development. Um, both funds, you know, I get this question a lot, do we back first time fund managers? Um, do we back first-time funds, you know, things like that? And, and the short answer is always no. Uh, we do not back first-time funds. Um, excuse me, we do not back first-time fund managers. We will, why is that? Because I think a lot of people um, who jump into venture capital don't have uh, two things. A, have a good understanding of the time that it takes to put in to, uh, to build a good track record uh, for a venture fund, as well as to actually see returns come from your investments that you make, especially if you're making the earliest stage investments, which can take anywhere from 10 to 12 years before the fund actually returns capital. Um, and two, because, um, you know, just, just to be almost blunt, we're looking for the best of the best funds, period that have a track record of investing in companies in our state. Uh, we're not set up to build a fund. I mean, I like to have hobbies, so I might personally mentor a fund manager, but I, we don't have the infrastructure to actually go out and build a fund from scratch. Just as important, if you're looking for the best of the best fund managers, I mean, I can find funds all day that are investing in, in companies in Chicago or in Indianapolis or, or Fort Wayne or wherever the cities. Um, that have an established track record of providing, of producing returns from their fund, which is what the state wants, which is what we want as taxpayers. Um, and just as importantly, those people also know what it takes to build a big company, build a you know, billion dollar exit uh, on behalf of their limited partners or their investors. So it, it, you know, in short, yes, there's a, there's, a, there's a difference, there's a stark difference between how we look for funds and, and what, we, what we can invest in and what we can't invest in. It's but it's not a, I'm not going to say one's bad, one's, one's sure. good. That's just how we're set up. Uh, take turns, go ahead. Yeah, so so uh, the way I look at it, remember, is, so we're way different. All, all, all my funders, not even first time, they were never, they didn't even work in venture capital before they came into the bachelor program. But, but my theory always is, um, yeah, I assume we've got some uh, Brewer fans here. So if the Brewers want to get the team better, they, they don't take their best players and increase their salary. Uh, they, they go out and get new players. So I think that um, if a fund is the best of the best, they should not need my capital. I mean, I, I've run two venture capital funds. I had a return. I didn't, I didn't need state money. I could go out and get it myself because if you have return and you're, you're, you're performing, you can raise capital. So I'm, I'm always extremely leery of existing funds that, that want to have capital for me because I say, why do you need my capital? If you're really good, you should be able to have it yourself. And so that when, when I looked at Wisconsin being 50th, obviously you know what my answer was. I thought we had to, we had to change the team. Mm -hmm. Kathleen? Do you want to answer that? Yeah. <laughs> okay, go ahead. I'll, I'll wait. So, yeah, no, no. I mean, yeah, you can, you can definitely take the opinion of you can build your own team from the minor leagues on up, and that's, that's fine. Uh, you can build teams that way. It is a longer-term approach. Yes. In terms of finding the best of the best funds, you know, we talked about Sequoia and Dries and Horowitz. Those are the best funds in the world. They are not taking state capital. They are also not investing in the Midwest. Um, that's right. We're talking about funds that have, you know, what we believe are solid track records, they might not be in the top decile, but we're looking for top quartile uh, fund managers. Uh, if not that, then they're definitely big on home team investments, meaning they're based in Indianapolis or they're based in Chicago, and they're making t dozens of investments around the state. Um, and they have a good, good, good track record to go with it. But in terms of finding the best of the best of the best, that is actually what the fund is set up for in its second layer of goals. So if you're 
building great companies, if you're finding good fund managers to invest in great companies that know how to build them, that inevitably does attract the coastal VCs who now want to invest in the Series B round or the Series C round uh, of your companies. Um, you know, I was talking earlier about a fund manager in Chicago, uh, Hyde Park Venture Partners, which some of you guys might know. Um, you know, they just finished raising Fund 3, uh, just, just a $100 million fund. Uh, fund 2 was kind of where they made their transition. And they did a very good job of building companies and attracting a lot of their portfolio um, to, to, to attract coastal VCs. So they've got co-investors in there from, you know, Bessemer Ventures, Menlo Park Ventures. Uh, they've got a deal with Sequoia. I mean, it, it, there are no big pots of money in the Midwest to fund a $100 million round or a $200 million round. So instead of trying to build a fund like that, we just said, look, we can build our, we can make, you know, uh, fund managers to get to a point where they can scale their companies. We can attract those coastal VCs who want to do those best of the best deals. Um, but you, and they don't need to take state money, like, like, like Ken said, but they're looking for the best company. So if we can get our fund managers to start thinking in terms of, um, hey, make these investments, scale your companies up, we're happy to make those introductions to the, to the biggest brands out there um, that can then fund the later rounds. That is how you get the bigger exits. That's how you get kind of that trickle down in the ecosystem where now you've got hundreds of new angel investors in the community, more venture capital funds uh, in the community, and more people who've actually seen what a billion dollar company looks like. Kathleen, you wanted to get in earlier. I just wanted to say, is that Ross up there? You have another fund manager Oh, here. Ross. Wave. R wave. So Ross is another fund manager. He's up in uh, Port Washington doing the Milwaukee counts. He'll be one of the Milwaukee um, uh, fund managers, also with the Badger Funds. Mm -hmm. Sorry, Ross. Didn't see you up there. I, I agree with your comment. I think that, that uh, the chances of us, us in the Midwest going more regional uh, to, to get a fund the size of A Advantage or Sequoia here is, is relatively low. And I, I, I agree with Aaron. If we have the deal flow, I mean, those guys are pretty greedy. Um, they want to make money. So if they see opportunities here that are structured the way they can participate, I think in the next, certainly the next decade, the best we can hope for, whether we do it with the way Aaron's done it, investing in the funds that are already there, or my way, we're, we're going to start from the ground up and build the minor league to the major league team. Um, the, the, the big rounds are going to have to come from somewhere other than here. Um, one, there's not enough deals to support a $500 million fund here, um, but they will come. I think they've came to some of Aaron's, and certainly if you look at the Badger funds, um, we've done second round investments in five or six companies. I think every one of them had at least one venture fund from outside the state participating. So certainly that's, that's what we want to see. They're not Sequoia, but they were, they were $100 million funds, and maybe if some of those go to the next one, we'll get ones that do five to 10 million. So certainly I think that opportunity is here. How often, uh, and any of the three of you, I won't ask Aaron for this, but uh, how often are we seeing investments made in Wisconsin companies right now as a result of, of venture capital funds? Uh, He's the playing bad, into your yeah, hands. The, ba the Badger Fund invest is writing a check about every two weeks. Every two weeks. Every, every two weeks. That's uh, not, that's including follow-on investments? Uh, that's including follow-on. Mm -hmm. in, in, in the first uh, two years, I think we did uh, 19 investments in brand new startups as the first investor. And remember, of our, of our six funds, um, only three of them are closed in investing. So, uh, so Ross and Rochelle are still out fundraising or closing in the future. My expectation, um, and remember, I don't get my expectation. I'll be in their office the next day, so it's, it's scary. Uh, my expectation is in a year, the, the, the Badger funds will have the resources to write a check a week. So from, from my viewpoint, as the manager of, of, of watching and, and participating, uh, that's a lot of deals to find that give us return. I, my prediction is in, is in a year or so, uh, the equation is going to be that we're going to be having difficulties finding uh, investments that will give national average return. Mm -hmm. um, I, we've been talking about uh, sort of the public sector as a catalyst for some mm -hmm. of this. Um, I want to talk about the private sector as a catalyst for a, a healthy innovation economy. Give me a sense of, of again, let's talk, uh, Matt, uh, for your purposes, more about uh, the Milwaukee area. And also, I guess you could talk to, to the Great Lakes region. Uh, both of you can talk to that. Uh, give us a sense, is enough being done by the private sector uh, to, to help with startups, to help with follow-on investments, that kind of thing? 
I think there, there is more being done, and that's promising. Over the past few years, we've seen increased investment, um, corporate venture capital funds being established in Milwaukee and Madison uh, that invest locally um, as well as nationally. Um, but I, I think there is more private sector uh, investment that could occur. I think that uh, the right vehicles have to be there to do it. I think you see some, uh, you know, incubator accelerator programs being subsidized by the private sector. Um, and um, I think that's where ultimately a lot of those ideas, where those products come from, um, that will ultimately be investable. So I think having more and more of those programs available that are high quality, run by entrepreneurs who have actually built and scaled companies, um, getting them involved in the development of, of early stage ventures is critically important for the future of our deal flow for, mm. for the, the venture funds in our state. Is there any concern at this point, and, I, and I've actually heard this expressed, that, that there's a feeling that uh, money is going to the coast, that it's not going to Wisconsin uh, uh, startup companies. Is, does that feeling exist? How strongly does that feeling exist? So I think that's what people think, that the big, pool, the big money is going to the coast. All the big foundations and endowments and uh, pension funds are sending all their money, all their risk capital to the coast to be managed. But I'd like to hear what you guys, do you guys believe that? It's what everyone I mean, thinks. Yeah, I mean the coast, because the, it's all relative. You know, if, if, if the venture capital industry is, you know, $100 billion, like 75, 80% of it is in California and New York and, and Massachusetts. So it's, it's relative. So I think the number is probably around $5 billion, makes up the Midwest venture capital ecosystem. So this is what I mean by it's very relative. Um, but are companies here sending it's, their risk capital to be managed on the coast? It's, it's, I, I, think, I think venture capital is a newer asset class for, for a lot of investors in the Midwest. And I think that you know, as more funds come of age in the Midwest and start to build a track record, I am seeing more funds in, 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 in Indiana and Illinois that are backed by local families, local family offices, high net worths, other entrepreneurs and things like that. Um, because actually they can't get access to the best venture funds in, on the West Coast. Well, and we've um, got a couple here. I mean, Northwestern yeah. Mutual now has a $100 million fund mm -hmm. that is being managed here. I don't know how much of it is going to land here. Yeah. Um, SWIB and Wharf, how big is Greg's fund? Um, Greg, Greg Robinson. 30. So 30 and then 60. they did a 30 at 90 million total fund, and he's investing some of it here, right? So, so I, I look at a couple of what I call trends in, in the venture capital industry. Uh, one, uh, Kleiner Perkins is, was the first venture capital ever. If you ever want to read a book, it's called Valley Boy by John Perkins, how they started. It's interesting, the, two the only two corporate investors in venture capital fund in the United States was uh, uh, Wausau Insurance and Century and Stevens Point. He went up there in January, they both said, wow, anybody that comes up here in January, we're gonna invest in you. They were the only two corporate investors in Venture Fund One, but uh, that was in the 70s. So one, one thing that's happening uh, on, a, on a big base in the, in, the, in the United States is, you know, if you look at venture capital funds, many of them have the names of the founders, Kleiner Perkins, right? That's the name. And those people, of course, as we all do, they're aging and, and, and dying. And, and so that when you have to have a transition to, to how those venture capital funds, as they transition to the next generation, they might not want to stay where, the, you know, they stay in California because that's where the senior partners live. So one of the things I'm hoping for with the getting a younger core of investor, invent, you know, human capital in Wisconsin, when that transition occurs, they're going to come here. And I, I, no one knows what's going to happen. A few of the firms have started to come up with transition plans from so the senior So are you saying partners. Kleiner Perkins is moving here? <laughs> uh, wouldn't we like? Uh, Perkins, Kleiner has died and Perkins, is, we wouldn't want him here, trust me, read the book. Um, it, it, and, and so the, the other big trend that's happening is if you look over the last five years, um, you know, um, if you go back 10 years ago, 90% uh, of all venture capital came from pension funds. SWIB, mm -hmm. uh, Milwaukee Employment Retirement Fund. So one, that asset class uh, is being uh, less and less are the pension funds doing that so that, that that financial resource of going into that asset class has decreased. And on the other hand, kind of replacing it, about 30% of all or 35% of all venture capital in the United States comes from corporate venture capital. So again, I think that's a, that's a great trend for Wisconsin because corporate venture capital is new. 
and I have to bet, you know, AmFam st has stepped up early. They're doing a second fund. That's They're, American Family. American Family has stepped up. Um, Northwestern Mutual stepped up. Aurora, you've, you've read about it in the paper. So, you know, that, that changes the dynamic, um, dynamic of the industry. Um, most of the corporate venture capital are not too interested in being the first investor in. They'd much rather have Dave and Ross and Rochelle do the early risk taking and they kind of watch it, but they have big dollars. I mean, for American Family, they were in one of my portfolio companies and put $15 million in it. And so that those two things I think are going to that changing of the dynamic in the industry, I think, is going to hopefully be beneficial for us that are at, at the lower ends to have a chance to, ri to rise up. I think both trends help us. Actually, I'll, I'll add one more trend to, to Ken. Um, it, if you guys look it up, there was a good article in The Economist about a year ago called Peak Valley. It's got a picture of a guy on a scooter riding around, basically leaving San Francisco because it's cost prohibitive now. Um, and so, you know, one trend that we're definitely seeing, you know, in both Indiana, Illinois, and probably throughout the whole Midwest is a lot of companies and a lot of investors alike out in, out in Silicon Valley are saying, you know what, yeah, we've got a lot of money, but we're basically paying for rent. And that's not good for returns. It's not good for scaling companies. Um, and unfortunately, San Francisco hasn't figured out a way to make it more cost <laughs> to make it more cost beneficial for everyone that lives out there. And so companies are basically saying, hey, we can still start the companies out in the valley, but the minute we need to scale or the minute you know we need to write a bigger check, you need to go out and find a second office or move your headquarters somewhere else. And so you're actually seeing a lot of companies from the valley now moving, you know, or setting up a second office somewhere else. You know, I've seen a lot of companies move to the Midwest. Is that happening in Indiana? It's, it's happening in Indiana. There's actually a, a company now that specializes in moving companies from the valley to somewhere else in, in, the, in the country called Beyond HQ, uh, which is venture-backed, the, the irony in all this. Madison, but, uh, Madison, um, <laughs> Madison, Madison too has yeah, benefited. Yeah, yeah. But I mean, I talked to, uh, I talked to a fund uh, a couple weeks ago called Foundry Group, which is a great venture fund in, um, based in Boulder, Colorado. They have six companies in their portfolio with offices in Birmingham, Alabama. No I, one thinks of Birmingham, Alabama as a hub for venture. But it's not that the companies were founded there. The companies moved there. Uh, and so you're seeing more of that kind of line of sight. Uh, Matt, you've been helping M7 attract some tech companies. Yeah, I was going to say in the next couple of weeks, you might see some news about a, a tech company from the coast uh, locating a secondary office here. Mm -hmm. um, and but, you've been helping a lot. You've been and, helping them figure and out. And I think that's it. incredibly important because I think that, uh, you know, Madison's really benefited from having Google, from having Microsoft, from Zendesk. having Zendesk uh, in their ecosystem employing uh, technology talent. Ultimately, you know, great companies come from great people who are really talented and can build products and, and scale teams locally. And so, um, you know, the more technology talent that we can retain here, grow here, keep here, uh, the better. And that's, that's a role the private sector can, can uh, play too. I think we've seen some local companies um, go establish innovation outposts in, you know, the Silicon Valley or New York or um, you know, instead of uh, investing and relocating that talent here to Milwaukee and helping build our legacy companies here. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, John, watch out. <laughs> How important do you think corporate law is with respect to non-competes and things like that that restrict the flow of talented human resources out of corporations into a startup? A lot of chatter about that. In California, they've sort of abolished that. Um, so at the, I'll give you kind of two local examples that I, I there's top of mind. Um, so Purdue University, just giving the academic example first, uh, led by Mitch Daniels, who's the former governor of the state of Indiana, um, basically said, hey, any IP that students create while at Purdue University, it belongs to you, the student. The university wants to just help you, you know, bring that technology to, to fruition. It used to be, you know, the university wants to latch itself on to all the IP, so that is no more. And you're starting to see other universities starting to take that, take that example. It's work. You, you actually see students excited about building new companies. They've got to blow up work. Well, I didn't say, well, I don't know about all that. Do you want some, some help? <laughs> oh, sorry. The, sec the second example, um, 
you know, this is, this is public, so I'm not sharing anything that won't divulge, but there is a fund that was announced earlier this year called Valor Siren Ventures, which is based in Chicago. Um, the reason why I mentioned that fund is because Starbucks is the anchor investor in it. About, they put in like $100 million or something. Starbucks, Target, Nestle, Marriott, and about 20 other corporations are investors in this fund. And the reason why they didn't want to have their own corporate venture fund was because they all realized that they suck at it. Um, they just weren't good at making their own investments. And so what they did was they basically formed a council and said, these are the broad, you know, kind of overarching industries that we're interested in, that we're seeing our, our, our industry move towards. It would be great if you guys could find technologies or find, you know, companies growing in these areas. Uh, and we're invested in the fund, who knows actually how to invest. Um, and so I, that's just one example that I've seen. But then I also have seen the flip side where more corporations want their own venture fund. You know, once I saw Dunkin' Donuts Ventures, I've, I've seen it all. So <laughs> it's, uh, it's, uh, <laughs> yeah. They raise their hands after I say this, they, they, they'd probably be embarrassed, but most of them argue against allowing your employees to leave. You know, you, they give re really conservative advice, they write, they write non-compete agreements that are probably unenforceable, but they write them anyway to scare the daylights out of the employees who don't know any better. So I think that that would be a big deal if we could get the, the law firms in the state to back off on this stuff. So I think, I think, John, more realistically, I mean, the, the non-competes only apply if the employee leaves and goes into the same type of business. And so that typically, Epic's a great, Epic's a great example. They have tons of talented people. They have some of the toughest non-competes there are. But the majority of the people that I see from Epic are not starting businesses that compete with Epic. Mm -hmm. They're using some of the skill set, the process, maybe the computer development skills, but they, they're, they're on different, different Pathways. Remember, I don't like lawyers either, but I. I, 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 I <laughs> did, did anybody it, tell it, you where we are today? Yeah, yeah. It, yeah. 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 No, no, lawyers have microphones everywhere. I know that. <laughs> but uh, we're, on, we're being recorded. But I, I think, in general, the ones, at least from the, the Badger Fund, you know, we're writing a check every couple of weeks, we, we don't see it come up where, yeah. where non compete's been an issue. We're going to open it up to the audience in, in uh, two minutes here. And then, can uh, I just give yeah. one, more, one more, I think, advantage of, you know, I'm from Wisconsin. You've obviously seen I only want to invest in Wisconsin. We're only building our team in Wisconsin. And I, you know, I do all my investing here. Uh, and, and so one of the other advantages I, I think that, that we could have in, in, in Wisconsin is, you know, and remember my focus and the focus of my funds is first investor in. We're, we're, we're writing the first in quotations, $500,000, a brand new company. They got a business plan. They're working at night. They probably still have their day job. You know, it's, you, you're, right at, you're right there at the beginning is that um, uh, one, one of the reasons, you know, the economic development is interested in venture capital is 65% of all new jobs are created by companies that are only a couple of years old. And that's because um, the first thing that, that, a, that an entrepreneur does when you invest in he or she uh, $500,000, they got to hire people, they got to get a team, they got to get an engineer, they've got to get a salesman, whatever it is. And that, so, so that if you look at a, initial investment capital, uh, the single biggest factor is uh, the compensation of the top people. In other words, you got to go out and hire, they got the entrepreneur, you got a head of sales, you got to compensate them. And so some of the advantages like going maybe up in Nina or over to La Crosse, I can tell you right now their compensation is, for those type of people, is 75% of what it is in Madison. So we come to Milwaukee and you look at some of the sections in Milwaukee in which, are, which are lower income or which are not quite as competitive, I think another advantage that Milwaukee could have is that you know, if you have the same per capita entrepreneur, that um, the compensation needs of some of those people starting up companies, if we could find them, are probably, are, are probably less, certainly less than Silicon Valley, and they might even be less than Madison. So that when, when, when we start the companies, we're writing the first investment money, first couple rounds, 
I mean, rent's essentially free. They're, they're giving it away all over the place. Um, lots of service providers now provide services to try to draw on clients. So the majority of that first 500000 to a $1 million is going to employees, and compensation for good people is, is the determining factor. I think that could be advantage here in Milwaukee. A couple of uh, quick final questions. Uh, networking, do, do we have a, a sufficient network, which most people seem to feel is very important to, uh, to a success of an innovation economy? Do we have that in existence, for example, in the Milwaukee area? What's your take on that? Um, I think we're building it. Um, Matt and I did this Five Likes Forum last May that was very successful at networking a lot of people from around the state, and we plan to do more of those kind of events. Um, maybe you want to say something about your... I was going to shamelessly plug Startup yeah. Milwaukee. You should, though. Yeah. You should, because you've created... Startup. You know, it is Startup Milwaukee. We can actually start up Wisconsin Week. So across the community, uh, over 60 events are happening here in Milwaukee over... Uh, 170 are happening across the state in 10 different cities. So you see that as a change in itself, a big change. Yes, we see that as an, an any time you can create collisions between the key stakeholders to drive the ecosystem forward, we view that as a positive. So bringing together entrepreneurs, investors, really giving people an opportunity a week to sample what's happening, all the resources that are available to an entrepreneur in an ecosystem, or giving a, a venture capitalist a week that they can come target a city to come meet with founders and um, you know, learn about an ecosystem or, or giving a corporation an opportunity to engage with uh, the startup ecosystem. We've been really uh, thankful of our partnerships with Northwestern Mutual and Advocate Aurora Healthcare. Got to get that plug in there. Um, but, uh, you know, uh, giving them an opportunity to engage with the startup ecosystem and, and gain ideas. We've seen cool programs like Reverse Pitch Milwaukee, which, which ran for two years and has now seeded two new companies here in, in the city. So, you know, and, and those connections and those companies come through these collisions that are occurring at events. Um, well, all that's been going so. on, Matt and I have also been um, trying to um, uh, make connections across the region mm -hmm. um, through the Five Lakes brand. This is how we met Aaron. We went to, he has a conference every year for the Illinois Fund of Funds and one for the Indiana Fund of Funds. We went to both. We've been trying to introduce him into the network. And then I see Dan Einhorn in back. He um, has formed a syndication group for venture capitalists. So I think you guys are getting together yeah. more. Uh, you know, we, we, we kind of started out, I kind of started the discussion with the things mm -hmm. that Kaufman said were not supportive one. But one of the ones that's a plus is, is networking. So right up there with serial entrepreneurs in return, well, one of the things that builds an ecosystem is networking. And most of us that are doing it day by day are, have sometimes trouble doing it. So we, it's great that we have people like Kathleen, Matt, and yourself. Uh, that it's a lot of work to organize these events. I mean, you only got to do it once. You never want to do it again. Um, mm -hmm. so, so I think that that is, that is one of the things that helps, would help move us from 50th is improved networking. You can, you can never have too much. Yeah. Uh, Aaron, you've traveled the furthest for this, uh, all the way from <laughs> Indiana. Um, get the final word here. I, I mean, we talk about collisions. Well, you've got your experiences in Illinois and Indiana. Ken has his here in Wisconsin. What's your takeaway? What, what should the people in this room leave with, and what should they know about your experience in these other states that might be relevant to us here? Yeah. Um, I think that the biggest takeaway is knowing that this conversation that we're having in this room has occurred in every single state in the Midwest consecutively over the last 10 years. This is not a new conversation. This, I've been in this conversation in Michigan. I've had this conversation in Kentucky, Ohio, Indiana, Missouri, uh, Iowa, Minneapolis, Minnesota. This is not a new or a novel conversation. Um, you know, we, we call the Midwest flyover. We, you know, we talk about these coastal VCs like, like they're almost mythical in a way. A lot of them actually went to, you know, schools in the Midwest, or a lot of them actually grew up here. So they're no different than, than, than us. However, actually with this networking question, I, I, would, I would actually just close out on this and just say um, one of the best pieces of advice I got both as a founder with, with my startups and again when I had my venture fund was there is a difference between networking in Chicago or now Indianapolis and networking in the Valley. Um, go spend some time in Silicon Valley. Uh, if only just a, a weekend or a couple of days, because you know, when we talk about manufacturing or something like that, or, or a company like an Epic, a life science company here, like 
our, our parents probably worked for those companies. Our grandparents may have also worked for those companies. That's a generational thing. That's, that's an easy conversation for, for, for a lot of us to have. But when it comes to how does a venture capital fund work, there's not a lot of people in the Midwest that you can have that conversation with, let alone if I asked you how many people in the Midwest have actually invested consistently for the last 10 or 15 years and actually have legitimate experience, there's only a handful of people in every little city that have done that. You go out to the valley, there are dozens sitting just in the Starbucks on Sand Hill Road that can have that conversation with you. So it's just the, 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 the amount of, of, of people that you can network with who've actually seen this, what it looks like in a downturn, what it looks like in an upturn, what it looks like when everyone is investing in, in AI technology or when everyone rushes to crypto. Like they've seen this story a hundred times over. So that's kind of how I, how I would leave this. I don't want us to think insular. I think the Midwest is great. I, honestly, I think we're ahead of the curve. Um, I know what we're doing in Indiana and Illinois is working, but I also push our fund managers to not just focus on what they see next door, but to focus on what the rest of the country is, uh, is doing and see how we can leverage what the coasts are doing uh, and bring that stuff back home so that we can grow faster. Um, you know, the Indiana venture ecosystem was $220 million in 2018. Year to date this year, it's over $400 million. We'll probably end the year at about 450, 500 million, just based off of what I've seen. The coast does not double every year. So just what we're seeing in Indiana, we have the ability to double, and we're not even scratching the surface I'm yet. curious. You have a direct flight from San Francisco to Indianapolis. To Indianapolis. Do you not? Yeah. Well, yeah. I mean, that's something that, yeah. I mean, I don't want to make a small thing. And that came from the exact but, target. I mean, much exactly. of the year, yeah. that does not Indianapolis exist to Madison, in Milwaukee. Milwaukee is two, two, it's two flights. It's yeah. two flights. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Need yeah. to say more. It's interesting. Yeah. Let's take questions. Um, if you're in the back and you're seated in the back, raise your hand. Eric has a microphone. He will take that. If you're in the front here, press down on the black uh, triangle in front of you. Keep your finger down on that, and we'll all be able to hear your questions. So. Mm -hmm. Cool. We'll start right here. Yes, sir, with the MLB hat. And that does stand for Major League Baseball. Is that uh, correct? Yeah. Uh, kind of? Yeah, I got it right after the Packers lost last week, so we're baseball fan. <laughs> <laughs> but we won this week. But uh, I just want to start off by thanking you all for a um, really enlightening conversation. Um, the sense that I kind of got from everything really is that, you know, here in the Midwest, you know, the infrastructure isn't all the way at its full potential yet. Um, and that we're really, I mean, we've been looking at companies coming here from the coast, which is, which is really cool. Um, I'm really happy about that. It's nice that we can see these people and rub shoulders with them. Um, but you all are VCs. Uh, you all have been involved, work with VCs here based in the Midwest. You all wouldn't be here if there wasn't an opportunity to invest here in the Midwest. So what I kind of want to know is what, and this is for all of you, what is your favorite example of a success story based here out of the Midwest? And by success story, I mean like somebody developed IP in an emerging market and took that, ran with it, and uh, got financing. And it, it doesn't have to be like fully mature, yeah. you know, maybe a success story in the making. Just, just an example of your guys' favorite success story. A couple examples. Anybody? I can't give a Wisconsin one, but I'll give an Indiana one that we shared at our, at our, our conference a couple months ago. Uh, there's a company in West Lafayette uh, where Purdue University is called Inari, I-N-A-R-I. Um, it's legitimately a seed technology. <laughs> so you guys have all heard of like farm to table and all that stuff. So these people, without doing any GMO, without any genetically modified um, process, are able to basically take a seed and build it for any type of climate around the world. Um, and so if you want to grow tomatoes in the desert in the Middle East, they actually have the seeds that can do that. Um, so this company, you know, it's, when you think about why is it at Purdue University, because Purdue has a very large ag tech uh, background, and one of the top seed professors in the world is at Purdue University. So they moved the company from Boston or Cambridge, Massachusetts to West Lafayette. Um, they had about 20 people there when we uh, first heard about the company earlier this year. Today, they're probably around 60. They'll probably be double that number this time next year. Um, they just closed on an $85 million round uh, of funding. They've raised about $120 million uh, to date. But it is, a, it is a 
it is a game changer when it comes to uh, growing food for the world's growing uh, population without having to, you know, stretch, you know, uh, current crop processes today. So it's an interesting company that's, you know, kind of local to Indiana. I'm not going to give the exact target story because I feel like that's been overplayed in, in our home state. But um, I am seeing more of these types of companies where people are imagining new things, new technologies, uh, and it's our job to make sure that funding is not the issue. So. You know, if you gave me a beer, I could tell stories for the rest of the day. Just, just so you know, it's like <laughs> just, open season. One, I just, I only get one. One really good open one. season like that. Ooh, yeah. geez, that you know, that's, you know, that's tough. Um, you know, my my favorite one from from my venture capital uh, days um, was you know the, the trucker guy. Uh, so, so we had um, uh, a Ro Robert uh, was a, a, a owner operator of a semi truck, um, and his he had three children that were going to go to college, so he decided he had to have a way to save money so he could, could put money aside for his kids. And so he, he developed this device in which um, he would store power in batteries underneath the seat in his cab, and he would heat and cool his truck and so he didn't have to run at night because one-third of the time a semi is running at night, and this would save him a lot of money, and he, he, could, he could put his kids to school. And, and so that um, he, he was driving around, and uh, this, it was the winter time in, in Tennessee, and they had a big snowstorm. And this hospital came on and called the state patrol and said, we, we need a whole bunch of supplies from the hospital. you got to drive through the snow. Can you find an independent truck driver? Because none of the fleets will come in. So, of course, our man Robert from Wisconsin said, you know, snow, come on. This is, this is like six inches. This is easy. So he, he drives his truck in. He, he brings the supplies to the hospital in Nashville. You know, of course, saves the day. And, and so that um, is probably you... Um, uh, all know there's there's the the truck driver of the year award is given out every year and so this hospital nominated robert and they said you know this guy brought in the supplies through the snow we know the story and, and he wins the, the the prize and he was the first mac truck driver to ever win the truck driver of the year award okay and so what did mac do they you know they send they send the the, the press out so the the press comes out to um to Robert, and they're taking pictures. And so one of the press guys says, "You know, what's what's this thing? What's, what's this thing underneath your, you know, your bed with all the batteries?" And the guy says, "You know, goes into his pitch. You know, does this." So he takes a bunch of pictures. You know, they they they, they chat, and so um, time goes by, and suddenly uh, uh, Robert gets a uh, gets a PO for 10, 10 stories. You know, ten things uh, from Mac Truck. He says we want ten of these, and that's when he came to me. I, he, he found me on the internet. Comes into, my, comes into my office and said, yeah, I got this purchase order for 10 from Mac. You know, I, I built one in my truck, and um, I need $600,000 to, to get this, to do this. And so, um, um, yeah, I was pretty excited. 600000 right in the range, and he was, you know, the, everything looked good. But in, in my fund, um, I had to get my investment committee to approve this, this deal. And so I told Robert that he had to give a, a presentation on a computer. I, I don't think Robert had ever seen a computer. But so he, he came in. And, and it's a long story. And he came in, and his, I swear to God, his, his suit was from Kmart, and he, it, it still had the creases from the box. So he puts this baby on, it comes in, uh, couldn't get the computer to work. So he, he's trying to give his presentation, and, and the computer doesn't work. And um, one, of my, one of my investment committees, Professor Luke is a, a, a really smart professor, but he's a nice guy who's sitting there. And he says, uh, Robert, how come your hands are so greasy? And he says, well, um, I sold one last night. I was in Illinois, and I just installed it. And on my way back, I, I parked my truck in the parking lot. And so he says, do you have your doodad out in the truck? And he says, oh, yeah, we do. So they all stormed out there. And um, of course, he put on a great presentation of you know, how, how his thing worked. Uh, he came back, and, I, and he wanted to give his presentation. I said, you know, your time's up. We have someone. I thought he was going to cry. I said, just keep calm. And so um, we, we invested $600,000. Uh, we bought 25% uh, of the company. It's in Watertown. Um, we sold it a couple of years ago. Um, made a great return. Uh, Robert got a check for $5.7 million. He still works there as the chief technical officer. Uh, they do sh two shifts a day in Watertown. Uh, they're right now producing about $3 million a month. Uh, that device costs $10,000. The name of the company is Idle Free. Um, to me, it's, it's, it's everything about venture capital. We, we bought a CEO because Robert wouldn't be one. He went along with it. Um, he's so passionate about his product that uh, he's still there today. Uh, and, and, and he, you know, he, we sold him, we sent him a check, you know, wire transfers. First he had to set up an account, he never got a wire transfer. So, you know, you gotta do this to get your money. And so uh, we had dinner together. I invited him out and said, dinner. And you know, he's the true entrepreneur. So what did he show me at dinner? 
<laughs> he had this new front end loader that he said was five times better. <laughs> and he wanted me to invest a million dollars. I said, Robert, just cash your check. It was about 60 times. Just cash your check and forget about this. Right? <laughs> but uh, that, that's a true entrepreneur. I always had no idea. He, he, he did it to solve a problem that was personal. Um, he got a couple lucky breaks. He wasn't afraid to take chances. Um, he let somebody else run his company when he couldn't do it. And now he's uh, more than paid for his children's education, and he's the, he's the king of water t Watertown, I can tell you right now. <laughs> let me take other questions. Anybody put up your hand if you have a question, we'll get to you. Yes, sir. Uh, Ken, you mentioned that one of the things that draws the most attention, most capital, and that is, is success, returns. Uh, do we not have enough stories of returns, or are we not telling the story well enough all around the country? Uh, if, you know, again, I'm, so I'm, I'm, I have my, my funds, so in three, I'm on the investment committee, so I think I see, I think I see a, fair, a fair view of all the investment opportunities in the state. I'm also on the investment committee and an, an investor in the NEW down in, in Appleton. I would say out of every 10 things I look at, if the plan was implemented perfect by the entrepreneur, it would be uh, an unsuccessful return for the investor. So I, so I think... You know, the, there's a whole, there's a myriad of things in there. One is course product. One is how they go about it, um, how big their dream is. You know, um, a, a, it's a host of things, right? Um, I, I can't tell you what Indiana and Illinois is. I can't tell you what Silicon Valley is. All I can tell you is what Wisconsin is. And I would say uh, nine out of ten things, it, even if we invested and they did everything perfectly, um, the return to my investment would be in, inadequate for the risk they've taken. I, I would add one thing that you did ask about, about, um, you know, in Indiana, it's called Hoosier Hospitality. In Michigan, it's called Michigan Nice. Sorry, I grew up in Detroit. Michigan Nice or, or Minnesota Nice, all that stuff. Um, the one thing that the Midwest has, and I personally am trying to change every chance I get, is that we're very humble. Uh, and people don't talk about their successes. I'm not saying you have to go around bragging, but trust me when I say that investors in, investors, that, that's what they do. They exude confidence. They want to hear about all the wins that you've had, and we don't do that in the Midwest. And so, so we're risk adverse, and we don't. And, and we we're don't, humble about and our we're, And we're humble. And yeah. we're humble about yeah. it. And 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 I, I'm starting to see more of the state organizations in Indiana actually add a hashtag in their Twitter called hashtag time to talk about it. Hashtag time to tell. And really, what they're saying is. People, please talk about your wins. When you go on vacation, when you go out and talk to VCs on the West Coast, tell them all the neat things that we're working on. We don't share our successes enough. And, you know, I'm, I don't want to feel like a one-man advocacy <laughs> for, for the state of Indiana, but there's a lot of neat things going on. And I'm hoping that everyone else will kind of take that away, too. Like, we do need to talk about our wins and our successes, because no one else is talking about them. Trust Thanks, Sarah. And I just want to yes. talk about something I do for on, a, on the radio. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. I, with Tim Keen from Golden Angel Investors, I do a show. Um, it's a segment on Lake Effect on WWM called How Did You Do That? And we interview, we're trying to get Robert. We're trying to get Robert. Yeah. We interview um, uh, founders who've had measurable success. We had Craig Culver recently. We've had a lot you probably haven't heard of. So it's available on the iTunes store. And there you go. it's available if you just Google, like, NPR, How Did You Do That? Yeah. We're trying to. There you go. Them. And one thing I'd add too is I think that events, weeks like this, are great platforms to highlight stories of successful. Are you trying to take away from my so, moment? And so our podcasts, <laughs> like, how did I do that? <laughs> Thank you. Hosted by Pulitzer Prize-winning <laughs> journalists. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. You're doing Gallagher. much better. But, but What's those, our those question back here? Are, are critical. <laughs> Hang on a second, Eric. There's a right, right down there. Yeah. But I do agree with. That, that is a true point. Mm -hmm. This is great that you guys are agreeing so much. Hi, I'm Barbara from Milwaukee. I'm He's a retired MPS school teacher, and I've invested locally in Fund the Milwaukee projects. Mm -hmm. um, that's how I choose to use my money. I love the stories. They s seem very powerful. My question is, the truck driver and his battery system, yeah. he's an over-the-road hauler, yeah. long distance. What happens when we can't do that anymore? What happens when we hit up with the climate wall? What happens when we go over the edge of the flat earth and we hit this wall that's coming towards us? Can technology save us all that way? That's my question. How are we going to invest in things that will really 
be sustainable and resilient going forward. I hear the seed story. I want to hear more about that because that sounds interesting, but growing seeds in the desert, we it, need no. to be able to grow food locally that we're, we're, not, we're not doing our, the local food growing that we need to be doing. So that's my question. What happens when we can't do all of these things? Is it just making money or are we really making things that will keep us going forward and keep a future for my three grandchildren? <laughs> it's, a, you know, it's probably not a question we can answer in an hour, but um, you know, it, it really depends upon whether the, the population wants to pay. Uh, in, in other words, do we have technical solutions? Yes. Could, could, could we form companies that would have technical solutions? Of course, we all could drive electric cars. It's pretty easy. We all could put, we all could put solar on our, so the solutions are technically there. And the question is whether we as a group here want, want to pay for it. Um, and, and so that, could I start a company that, and invest in one that made solar, made electric, uh, made carbon-free um, uh, heat pumps for my house? All, all those things are, are, are readily and easily done. The trouble is no one wants to buy them. So it, it's, not, it's not the supply side, and it's not the venture capital side, and it certainly is not the technical side. It's the demand side. If everyone in this room said, I want to have, I, I wanna have uh, solar on my, on, my, on my house for whatever reason, and went, had their checkbooks out, I could get you a company that, that would make it. So that, you know, I don't think it's on our side of the table. I, I think it's on the demand side, whether people want to pay. Um, hopefully that changes, but... You know, someday it has to change, right? There are some efforts, too, like uh, um, uh, the, the Brew Accelerator Program. I mean, there are things from water conservation ideas that are, are out there and, and that some people are trying to, you know, I think turn into solid business ventures. Yeah. So there are some of those things happening, I think. Uh, at there, least there just isn't demand. P people don't, people don't want to pay. Other, qu other questions? Yeah. Yeah. Yes, sir. Yeah. Uh, my yeah. Um, and there's several law students in the audience today, and uh, my dad's a small business owner, so I've certainly heard uh, comments like yours about attorneys before. Uh, what, what do you believe <laughs> the, uh, the next generation of, of lawyers in the Milwaukee area can do to help be part of the solution uh, when it comes to startups and uh, investment? Um, <laughs> you, you, you remember, you asked a very, I'm a very biased person, right? Um, so, so that. Um, you know, when, when I start up a company, there's only, a, there's only two ways uh, service providers, whether it be accountant or lawyers, can get new business. One, they can steal it from their competition, or they can, they can get it from a new company. That's your only two alternatives. You can steal it from your competition, but it's difficult. And so that um, I always think that when we start up uh, new companies and, and um, I write a check for my 25000 or my fund writes a check for $50,000, um, the place we want it to go the least is service providers. And so we're always hoping that um, uh, service providers, lawyers, accountants, uh, will take a certain amount of, of companies, whether it be one, 10, or 15, so many, and say, we will do 15 startups um, in a competitive way, and, and we won't start to build them until they're profitable, until their third round, um, th that kind of stuff. Uh, um, in other words, the more, more of the investment capital that can be, good, be put into developing product and buying customers and finding customers, the more likely we are to be successful. Uh, the more money that is expended in service providers, the, the less likely we would be to be successful. Um, you know, it, it's tough because uh, service providers such as yourself are, are compensated by the hour, so that the more hours you put, the more pay you want. Me, I'm compensated by, by the outcome. So if I can spend one minute and get a great outcome, I'm, I'm a happy man, right? Uh, it doesn't matter how much time I spend, so that I always like to see the per hour people take a risk with me. Um, you know, some law firms take uh, equity ownership. Of course, I don't like that because I would, if you give me equity ownership or pay, I'd rather pay, right? Because I want the upside. But if you came to me and said, would you bring me 10 new customers and I will provide services for them for X amount of time and then they become my billable customer, that would be a great deal for both, I think. I think there was a question. In the red sweater, did you have a question? Oh, okay, I'm sorry. Okay. I have a question about education, and I'm wondering if that's on your radar. In terms of, I listened to a national speaker by the name of Ravi Uthasing. I don't know if you know him, but um, he talks about how our current educational system 
really drums out the creativity of students. And I'm just wondering if you see that, if you're concerned about that, or what your take is on the educational system um, keeping the entrepreneurial spirit of young people present or as a viable option. So personal, not, not 50 South or you know, state fund related. Um, I'm involved in two organizations. That's their only mission, is to teach entrepreneurship to school age and, and high school age children. Um, because I look at that as uh, basically an alternative to the more traditional career or for students you know, who might not have the ability to go to a top college. It gives them a chance to actually say, hey, entrepreneurship's actually a viable option. Um, so I won't speak about the public school curriculum per se, but I will say that teaching everyone about entrepreneurship I think is a good thing. Um, for those of us that are old enough to remember the last recession in 2008, 2009, or even the previous tech bubble well, we in go back 2000, to or we keep going back. <laughs> I mean, when you've been laid off from a job and you have to fend for yourself, knowing how to fend for yourself is a great skill set. So I'm a big believer in, in teaching kids. Matt, you're in the great talent, yeah. talent business. And, and I would say, yeah, I'd say teaching entrepreneurial skills is vital uh, to the future. Uh, of our economy. I've been involved in kind of the creation of the Commons, which is an entrepreneurial skills accelerator in the region that's worked with hundreds of college students from 24 colleges and universities to get them entrepreneurial experience. Um, I think Marquette is doing things at the engineering school to foster more entrepreneurial thinking and, and leadership skills um, through their e-lead program, which is really interesting. Um, and, and I think it's really important, too, to even start in K-12 and, and Elmbrook School District, and now it's, it's spreading to other school districts in the region, uh, has started the launch program, which teaches entrepreneurial skills to, uh, to high schoolers and I think even middle schoolers as well. So I think that, that's really important. I think also teaching technical skills is important, too, at the K-12 level, because that's where we'll see more diversity in tech, is if, if students are exposed to uh, computer science, uh, at, at the middle school level even. And so expanding funding for computer science education is critically important to, to our future of our economy here in Wisconsin. Let me get to this gentleman's question. That may be the last one possibly. Go ahead. Um, my, my question uh, had to do with uh, excel, uh, kind of a startup accelerators and business accelerators and incubators. Um, I didn't hear uh, earlier any, any, any mention of that. I thought that that might be a thing that, that, that helped our economy and fed into um, investments that in, uh, venture capital funds would, would look at. How, um, maybe for Wisconsin and, and for the Midwest, because we have uh, fund managers from outside of, uh, outside of Wisconsin, ha has, have accelerators, have they been kind of returning their, the, 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 the time, effort, and money uh, invested in them and, and building the businesses that come to them that, that, that it's worth the uh, venture capital investment, uh, at least in, in the Midwest? Have you found that to be something that uh, venture capital groups look to? I just didn't hear anything earlier about them. Yeah. I mean, incubators and accelerators, are, I think, are great if you have a startup company and you want to get um, more training or, get, you know, in increase your network uh, through an accelerators uh, program. There are different levels of accelerators. I mean, there are, you know, top tier, second tier. There are university programs. There are city programs. So it really depends on which one you're, you're planning to go through. I mean, I know that the generator is big in, in, in Milwaukee and Madison. Uh, you know, you've also got Techstars, which has two accelerator programs in Indianapolis, one in Chicago. Um, you know, Y Combinator is probably the most well-known uh, accelerator out there in the Valley. Um, I think they're absolutely great. I think they're phenomenal in terms of teaching and, and, and like I said, giving access to, um, to a much larger executive or coaching network for a think, lot of startups. As do you well think as they're worth the customers. equity you give up? I think it depends on what stage your company is at, and I think it depends on uh, you know, where you are as a founder. If you're a third or fourth time founder, you probably don't need an accelerator, but if it's your first time starting a company, I think it's nice to have that network and, and have that program behind you. Um, if your question is about whether or not they make money from an investment standpoint, that's a different. That's a different. They're, they're really not an investment yeah. thing. They're, yeah. they're, a, they're a service provider in mm -hmm. which corporations put in money for brand building. I, I'm with Aaron. They, they, they provide a lot of things. Do we? Do I? When I write my twenty-five thousand or my five hundred thousand dollar check from venture funds, see any improved probability of success because they went through an accelerator? N no, I don't. But on the other hand, do they? Increase the amount of opportunities I get to look at? Absolutely. 
I mean, it depends which one you're looking at. Thank you. That's a much better rewarding of my question. Thank you. <laughs> I have, uh, any other? Okay, we've got one final question. Yeah, go ahead, please. I um, went to graduate school at Stanford, um, and uh, by basically seeing both coasts and what's going on, sometimes it's hard for me here in the Midwest, um, meaning that people are very loyal. Um, they, they, when they say they're going to do something, they really do it. It's not quite that way on the other coast, and I think that's why there's more excitement and more uh, action going on and all of that. And I just ask that uh, more is done here in the colleges, uh, the communication of, of sharing entrepreneurship. Um, I'm sure that there are classes in the master's degree programs here where students are required to actually start businesses. Let's start talking about that in the community. Um, an example is at Stanford, uh, when I graduated, um, all of us talk about all the businesses all the time because they're constantly every month hitting me up, um, Spike Venture Capitalist um, was started by Stanford so that we actually will um, provide money to recent graduates um, who want to start businesses. I think more can be done on the communication front. Um, it'll also help employers here in Wisconsin. When we see somebody that's an entrepreneur who's doing really well, let's say in an MBA program here in Milwaukee, we might say, hey, we want to take them on and we want to partner with them. Um, and, and we want to also hire them for their expertise. I think there's just so much that can be done with greater communication. I think that's, that's something that we're, we're losing. And we need to be able to see that sophistication and um, the, the marketing and everything else that goes along with it. Anybody want to say something and then we'll wrap things yeah. up? I mean, I think, I think the universities can do a great job of that. I think that, um, you know, just the Midwest in general, kind of my, when I, when I mentioned we should all go network with the coast, there's, there's a limitation on that too. I don't want anyone in this room going out and starting a better version of Uber or Lyft. Like, I don't think you're going to figure out a way to deliver my food one or two minutes faster. I'd rather we don't focus on that. I'd rather we actually focus on stuff that maybe we see on a regular basis as a real problem. And, I, and I've actually started to challenge more of our fund managers to look for bigger problems that are more local. So for example, one of the startups that I'm most excited about in Chicago is trying to address gun violence. That is not something that I would see in Silicon Valley. That's not something that I would see out of a fund in Cambridge, Massachusetts. But that's a big deal in Chicago. Um, that impacts a lot of us. And so figuring out a way to you know, um, say, hey, this is a big, even if, it's, even if it's just a big local problem, it's a very big local problem you know, in terms of number of lives that are impacted, in terms of how much resources that we spend as a city and a state uh, towards stuff like that. So just challenging uh, and communicating, but I think more so just challenging our entrepreneurs, challenging our fund managers to kind of look around what's around kind of like their neighbors and what's going on on every side of town, not just what's going on, like the big trends of you know, ride sharing or food delivery and stuff like that, but um, really find out, hey, what are the big problems out there uh, that we can actually uh, use technology to fix? Um, so that's something that I've, I'm personally always watching. Yeah. I'm going to wrap things up yeah. there be respectful of everybody's uh, time. Uh, thank you very much for your time, your interest, your attention today. And thanks uh, most of all to our guests for being with us today. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs>